Now, when we look at this little group here, this constitutes how we test the joint, doesn't it? Because what I'm going to do is to do symmetrical movements of the trunk here and have a look at how the sacroiliac joint works. It should work equally on both sides. If it doesn't, it means there's something wrong there. If I find that one side goes forward further or starts moving before the other, there's a difference in that sacroiliac joint to the other side. And if it's painful, then presumably it's significant. If it's not painful, it could represent just these changes of shape from one side to another. Who knows? So those are kind of important considerations. How do we do asymmetrical movements? We could get behind somebody or get them on a treadmill and make them walk. Or we could do an asymmetrical movement like this, which is the basis of the kinetic test, where one leg is going into flexion and the other is relatively in extension, and have a look at the behavior. We could come into a position where one leg transfers weight to the other. So in effect, one leg is going into a closed chain, the other is coming out of the closed chain, just by gently transferring the weight. That would be another way of just getting a feel for what happens within this joint. So these movements of the trunk or the lower limbs are going to be an important way of trying to assess whether we should go further with this joint in terms of our analysis. So, when we look at this thing back to here, and we take hold of an ilia, or a pelvic rim, thanks, Anne. like this, and I'm walking, and one hip is going into extension, one leg is going into extension at the hip, and the other is going into flexion, and the Ilia tend to follow that plan, so one's going into extension, this goes into anterior rotation like this, and this one will go into posterior rotation. We've got a movement from below which is being transmitted into the ilia. We know that we've got the L5 connected to the ilia, so if one's going forward and one's going back, it's going to change the tension on the iliolumbar ligaments. That's got to influence what L5 does. And if L5 is influenced like that, it's got to influence what the sacrum does. So when we kind of look at this, and we sort of see this motion of coming back and forward, the sacrum is going like this, and tilting into a rotated flex position as we move along like this, which is speculated to take place along these oblique axes. And that seems reasonable, because we've got an oblique axis, haven't we, for all the vertebra. We're saying this, that it isn't a z-axis and a, and a y-axis around which this takes place and this takes place. What we're saying is that it's an oblique axis, because the two cannot occur separately. And in fact, that is what was said earlier by um, Beale, that we have this movement of the sacrum, and he believed that it behaved the same as any other vertebra, but not quite as completely, so that the coupling down here isn't quite as complete as the couplings in the rest of the spine if the spine is generating the movement. Of course, if the ilia is generating the movement, that force is going to be directly through the sacrum. So I'm in a sort of school, I guess, and I think um, Kent's in the same school because I heard him talking about this to the group, that we've got to think about the sacrum in my sort of things, and I don't know how you're thinking about this, as being just a part of a vertebral group. So what happens to the sacrum in terms of these movements is what's happened previously to the rest of the spine. You know, it's like this argument, and we could just cover this at the moment, that when I bend forward, what happens to the sacrum? In many books, you get the sacrum tilting backwards like this. Well, if you look at any vertebra, and you sort of said to them, I bend down to L1, and you looked at L1 and it's like that, and you compared it with L2, L2 would look as if it's extended. It's just that that flexion hasn't reached this yet, which it will pull it down into flexion. So that if you feel on the 
sacroiliac joint. And of course, I, I'm going to lean back, which confounds your feel a little bit for a start off, because it means it's coming back towards you. There's going to be a point where L5 has gone forward, but the sacrum hasn't come forward yet. But is this extended? We don't normally think in those terms. We never look at the lower bone. We know that relatively, if this flexes, this will be a little extended relative to this. But as this force comes down into the iliolumbar ligament, which is absent at 5 but goes into S1, it's going to pull the sacrum forwards. That's the whole basis of this test of bending forward like that. The sacrum is pulled forwards. How quickly does it pull the ilia forward? Or is there a relative freedom of movement of the sacrum on the ilium so the ilium isn't yet pulled forward? If it's stuck, it moves the ilium much quicker than on the other side. That's the whole basis of Pedalou's test, the forward bend test. And when we come into extension, it's the same thing. If we looked at any point in this movement, we might be able to say, ah, oh, yeah, sacrum is flexed relative to the extending spine. It's just that we haven't got impaction of those facets yet to take it back into extension. So I have never had a real trouble with that thing. I've had trouble with the diagrams that show this going backwards because I think it's true, but it's an erroneous observation. It's simply that every vertebra does that if you just take them at a point in time. And so I think it's, we've got to think about it in terms of rotation. Now what happens with coupling? According to Beale, what happens with coupling, and of course this is when we get into a bit of confusion because they're all obviously looking at um, cadaveric specimens that are pulled around. We don't know still whether all that can take place in vivo when we do it, and how would you ever test this? We can palpate it. But you know about palpation? There's a wonderful little thing in Dave Reed's book, like a ten-point plan on where we can go wrong, and I'll read it out tomorrow. I didn't bring it today, but I'll read it out tomorrow. But one of the things that is said in Beale's thing that they took all of the senior instructors, we're not looking at students now, we're looking at the senior people that knew, thought they knew what they were doing, okay? And they were all asked to just tell what is the position of the posterior superior iliac spine on this group of patients. They didn't say that the results were awful, he said that the um, a, amount of agreement was disappointing, which probably means it was awful. And these are all senior people looking at posterior superior iliac spines. And now what we're saying is that we can measure these little variations in movements and all that stuff. We've got to be a little careful. I mean, we might feel it and talk like this amongst ourselves, but when we're talking to other people and communicating, I think we've got to have some method that, you know, they could be comfortable with as well, if they're sort of a bit picky about what we feel. And we've got to be very much challenging ourselves all the time as to what we can feel. And that's what I'd like to get out here. Movement takes place, no question. And we're going to feel these movements, and we can test these movements. But the question is, how far more can we take it with theorizing? Well, that's all right in little groups, but it's not going to get out as, you know, this is the hard and fast way that this thing moves. We've got the answer to this. I think we should sort of stick within the mainstream more or less and gradually perhaps try and influence the mainstream. But unless we do, then I don't think we should be propounding sort of really weird ideas out there. I think it's dangerous for our own position. So let's just go on for one second more on this and then I'll give you just a little bit of opportunity just to stretch and so on. Here's a number of theories, once again taken from Kapanji, which shows a variety of things. Now, you know, sometimes it's kind of amazing to look at this thing. You wonder how everything was come up. Here's the transverse axis. And, okay, is it within the two poles of this horizontal or this vertical surface? Or is it just behind, as is shown in this di um, diagram here, within the interosseous ligament? That would seem to be a better spot, wouldn't it? than here. Because if it's here, it means that that will reflect itself back over that lever arm into the interosseous ligament, which is hugely strong. Whereas if we put it in the interosseous ligament, we could get a little bit of movement this way within the synovial movement. So it would seem to put it in the stiffest structure means that anything that moves is away from that and working over that lever arm. That would seem to be kind of reasonable. 
Look at this thing here. This was considered to be a axis of movement. If the axis was there, what would be happening at the back? It would be jumping up and down like this, over that lever arm. An inch or a, you know, a half a centimeter movement there is going to represent a huge movement at the back. That wouldn't seem to be reasonable in this joint. So when we talk in terms of osteopathic things, they've got actual rotations taking place around the pubis. Well, if rotations take place around the pubis, what's happening at the back here? I mean, I have a real problem with this. And they're, and they're quite serious when they talk about this. And I just wonder, has anybody thought about what happens if it's here? Can that take place? So these are things. This last picture here is the picture taken from Weissel, who did a PhD in this in the 50s. And he came up with really what is that first or second um, transparency that I put up, that the movement is a mixture, a kind of composite, between a little rotation along that transverse axis and a little movement along the postero-anterior, the z-axis there. And that that seems reasonable, that it can kind of adjust itself regardless of where it is with perhaps a little bit of rotation and translation. And when we think of all those irregular joint surfaces on that first diagram, if I produce some rotation, anterior rotation of the sacrum like that, it's going to alter that arrangement and then we're going to have to think about that changing as the position of the sacrum changes. And so I think this little bit of a twist and a little bit of a shuffle is what was, this was called by Greg Greed, the sacroiliac shuffle. It kind of just adjusts itself a little, it turns itself a little, it moves a little, and it's got that capacity. Now, when we see these irregular joint surfaces, Jim Meadows sort of suggested in 1984 at the IFONC Congress that the thickness of the hyaline cartilage should be taken into consideration here. And perhaps the compression of the hyaline cartilage gives the potential for movement in a joint that doesn't seem as if it should move very much. And indeed, if we trans, you know, and this is a dangerous thing, <laughs> uh, Bogduck makes a very good point, that if we've done a lot of work on the thoracic, on the lumbar spine, we can't immediately extrapolate all those kind of theories and findings to the thoracic spine and say what goes on in one area goes on in the other. He says we don't know until we've tried it. Okay, so I'm doing, going to do that now, extrapolate. But if we look at the lumbar spine and we look at the thickness of the hyaline cartilage in the zygopophyseal joints, this is part of a breaking mechanism. In other words, as we go and we move so that we've got compression of the hyaline plates on the side opposite to which we're turning, the compression that goes on in the hyaline cartilage is part of the absorbing mechanism. It squeezes fluid out of it and then the fluid is taken up again. And that's like a little hydraulic cushion. And it could well be that when we're talking about the thickness of the hyaline cartilage on the sacral surface, that part of that in the way that we can move is to do with the deformity that can take place in that hyaline cartilage. It's purely speculative, but it seems reasonable in a joint whose surfaces are like this and very irregular, that something allows it to move, no question. Now then, let me give you five minutes just to stop and stretch yourself and move around because I know these chairs are comfortable when you sit on them until you start moving that upper part about. Have a look at the movements of this joint because we can then go directly on to the sort of testing of this joint and, and so on, all right? We tend to think of extension and lordosis as the same thing. They have got some similarities and they've got some differences. We're going to see a difference now between the two. If we're talking about the position of the lumbar sacral junction, this is variously given, but in the latest Bogda Can Tell Me book, they talk about a 60 degree angle taken, you know, from here like this. So that when we have the L5 here, and when we increase the lordosis, or whether weight is just going down, there's going to be a tendency for the sacrum to be taken forwards like that. And that will be called sacral flexion. 
this will be a relative movement and so the ilia would be relative going into posterior rotation which is shown on there now then if we increase this is just the effect coming down here of gravity it's going to tend to sort of take the sacrum into the pelvic brim if we increase the lordosis if we look back in time this was part of a primary curve system so we have the cervical spine thoracic spine is a primary curve lumbar spine a secondary curve sacrum a primary curve and if we increase a primary curve we'll increase the angle of the secondary curve like that so in lordosis the sacrum goes into flexion whereas I was saying in extension as the extension arrives down there it's going to pull the sacrum back also into extension so here are two differences between extension and lordosis they've got similarities but they've got differences as well here's one of the differences so if I increase my lordosis like that then the sacrum goes forward if I come into this position like that the sacrum will finally be taken backwards in a extending position now then if we look at these symmetrical movements of the pelvis going forward it's going to influence the posterior tension on these ligaments that's why so much of the strength of the joint is posterior because of this forward effect of gravity it's our counter gravity system but of course if we've got a relative motion of the ilia it's going to produce a relative motion anteriorly also of the pubis and when we think of the ilia situated like this and we think of the sacrum like this with its wedge shaping from above downwards but also its wedge from front to back as it goes between the ilia then the ilia will tend to go together at the back separating the front so the attenuation of the ligaments and the disc at the front will be part of this absorbing mechanism whereas if we take this sacrum and it goes into extension it forces out the ilia at the back which forces it in at the pubis at the front and the absorption will be by compression so all of these things have compensatory absorption through the whole of this pelvic rim mechanism so on these pure movements of going forward we can get this happening and coming backwards we get the opposite happening within the whole of the ilia for the pure movements if we start to take the motions of the asymmetrical motions then we're into a little more complexity here of the spine that as I go into a side flexion position like this to the left hand side what I'm going to produce is a rotation throughout the spine it's going to produce an asymmetrical rotation within the ilia one will go forward and one will go back so that as I go into side bend like this the ilia on the left side will go into an anterior rotation the ilia on the right side will go into a posterior rotation so here's going to be a way of testing this we could actually have perhaps let's say what we think is a posteriorly rotated ilium a posterior innominate on this side and I could ask the patient to go over to this side if this is held posteriorly rotated and it needs to anterior rotate for me to side flex my spine the side flexion will be restricted so we can kind of use a lot of this stuff as part of our testing procedures so it's kind of useful now let's just talk for a minute about the movements of the kinetic test
This is, was, I described this test from some work that Cliff and I had done in the early 70s, and I described it in 1973 at the um, World Confederation of Physical Therapy in Montreal, and we gave a lecture on this particular thing. And we were going to publish this, and then we found in a 1915 article the same sort of thing. It wasn't quite as complicated as we'd made it, but it was actually to made these observations, so we did nothing about it. In 1985, Gillet, who is a Belgian chiropractor, published this, and so it's now the Gillet test. <laughs> so we've missed out there. Okay? <laughs> that was in 1985. But um, Gillet had done some work before that, and it's an interesting thing that in Belgium, chiropractors were not allowed to use x-rays. So they developed a whole set of motion studies, of which Gillet is one of the leading exponents. So he didn't feel that x-rays were absolutely mandatory because they weren't allowed to do them. So they did a different sort of set of tests. Now we've got within chiropractic at the moment, within the modern group, a great concern about how much ionizing radiation is used on patients. And at last the um, Los Angeles School have come out with a real set of criteria. And the criteria is like, do not use x-rays unless there is history, that the trauma could have caused fractures. Weight loss in the last little while, sort of suggesting tumors or cancers or something like this. And a whole series of things like this suggesting that for the average mechanical problem, x-ray should never be used. You know, so they are going to have to develop a different way of finding stuff out now, which means they're back into what we're doing. How's that being accepted? Pardon? It's only the last journal. Um, when I was at this workers' compensation board, one of the orthopedic surgeons, um, Jenkinson, who's the senior orthopedic surgeon in Calgary, um, at one of the hospitals, he asked the chiropractor who was sitting next to me, he was a really good guy, um, you know, about this particular thing. And um, he kind of fobbed him off with saying, kind of he agreed with it, but x-rays are still quite important for working certain things out. But, I mean, we know that the subluxation doesn't show up on x-rays, and this business about you need them to know which direction is nonsense in most, most terms. And people like Gillet you know, have, done, have worked on this, and now he's become a guru in the chiropractic profession because he's got this other kind of skill, which we've developed and, and not said much about. We've just continued to kind of go with it. But... In terms of the sacroiliac joint, I mean, x-rays have never been particularly helpful unless we've been talking about disease processes. They're not being going to show what position a thing has been in and how important that is. So, what are we doing about with this kinetic test? Let me turn my back to you and just say that we're looking at the kinetic test from the standing side and from the movement side. We'll look at this from both sides, of course, but let's just take this as the example, the moving side, first of all, that as I come up into flexion like this, it's a simple concept, there should be a posterior rotation of the ilium. So as I come up into here, on the moving leg side, the ilium, as the motion in the hip joint is taken up, and this is usually about 85 degrees of flexion, you don't sort of see it down here so much, you've got to get it up into this position, that you will see a posterior rotation of the ilium. Now then, only talking about the moving leg side now, only talking about the moving leg side. If we have got a movement fault, it's stuck somewhere on its limited range of movement, but not fixation at the terminal part of movement, okay? What might happen under these circumstances is this, that I will come up like this, and now I'm demanding that my ilia should go into posterior rotation against the sacrum. And it can't, because there is a limited range of motion. So, either I go up to there and don't go any higher, but I'm instructed to go higher, so I do it in two ways, or one of two ways. I might go like that to get it up higher, and I compensate with the lumbar spine, which is perfectly reasonable, thinking of the HPL complex, or I come up like this, and what I do is a funny kind of hiking movement like that to try and achieve a little bit more flexion that I'm instructed to do, because I cannot do it with the ilia going back. Now then, if the ilia is at the fixation of its range, if it's posteriorly rotated, this wouldn't particularly pick it up, because it's got to go into posterior rotation. So 
the fixation kind of accommodates on the iliosacral side the motion. If it's in anterior rotation, then it wouldn't be able to accommodate. And I'd be sort of hiking or doing this fairly early in the range if it was at the fixed, at its terminal ranges of motion. But if it's limited throughout the range, I might be able to get a little bit further and then I would compensate. Now, on the standing leg side, what happens there? We're feeling at the posterior superior iliac spine and we're feeling at S2 in the median on the spinous processes of the sacrum. And what's going to happen on this side is that as I come up like this, the ileal movement will go posterior. Then it'll take the sacrum with it so that we now have a sacral motion on the ilia, which gives the impression that the ilia is going forward. Now, the ilia can't go forward because it's held stable because of the closed chain nature of the hip and the ilia. So we get this as the feeling, but in actual fact, it's the sacrum that has gone into extension against this ilia. What happens if it's abnormal? Usually, it's not quite so easy to feel if it's abnormal. What happens is the patient comes up like this and they're having all kinds of problems kind of stabilizing themselves on this side, whether it be stiff or whether it be hypermobile. But occasionally, in somebody that can kind of hold on, or you sort of encourage them to just take a little bit of a balance like this, they can come into this position, and you can see they cannot get the sacrum to go back like this. So they do exactly the same thing. They try and kind of come up with the hip going up by flexing the spine. So that's the kinetic test, the two aspects. There's the one on the moving side and one on the standing side, and we, of course, so that we've got this coming up, feeling both sides, that coming up, feeling the kinetic side and the opposite side. So what should you feel on the standing side in a normal person? In a normal person, you should see stability, first thing. Next thing you should see, that when you get to very much to the 90 degree position, that the sacrum has come back into extension, and it looks as if the finger that, or the thumb that's on the sacrum descends like this. That's what you'd feel. Or, if you were looking for a basic comparison, it would look if we're on the ilia, say, with the moving leg side, the ilia appears to come down like this. On the standing leg side, the ilia appears to go forward like that. It's not the ilia going forward, it's the sacrum continuing this rotation against that ilia. But if you think about what the ilia appears to do, it's kind of good. It should come back on the moving leg side, it should go up and forward on the standing leg side. Now, what I'd like to do is to leave for a little while the various aspects of the sacroiliac joint that are specifically related to muscle energy. I think in manual therapy we haven't gone far enough and perhaps in muscle energy they've been a little bit too liberal with you know the speculations about what can go on and perhaps we can get some